Welcome to our sixth edition of the Eyeball webinar series, Bioscan, Illuminating Biodiversity. Our presenter today is Professor Florian Lese from the University Duisburg-Essen in Germany. Florian studied biology at the universities of Marburg and Bochum in Germany. He did his master's at the Max Planck Institute for Freshwater Biology and his PhD at the Alfred Wegner Institute's Helmholtz Center for Polar and Marine Research. After that, he went to Ruhr University in Bochum to build a research group focusing on molecular methods to assess biodiversity in aquatic ecosystems. Since 2015, he is full professor and head of the aquatic ecosystems department at the Faculty of Biology at the University of Duisburg-Essen. He coordinated the Pan-European DNA Aquanet Consortium that focused on developing and implementing environmental DNA-based tools as part of regulatory biomonitoring. Today, Florian will be talking about the work of the Aquatic Ecosystem Research Group, in particular, the study of the impacts of multiple stressors on freshwater biodiversity using metabarcoding. Over to you, Florian. So good morning, everyone. Thanks so much, Dirk, and all the Bioscan team for, for having me here in the, in the webinar. I will take the chance today to speak um, about one aspect of the research we're doing in, in our group which is multiple stressor research. And I will in particular talk about how studying the impacts of multiple stresses can benefit from using as well DNA metabarcoding and barcoding data. So in general, most of you may know, our, uh, our group studies aquatic biodiversity from deep sea to highest mountains, from the poles to the tropics. In the past, we did a lot of Antarctic research in particular. And by doing so, and by using in particular genetic methods, but also morphological methods, uh, ecological analyses and optical methods, we identified many new species. And especially using sequence data, we identified, for example, in the Iranian mountains that this one species, Gamros komareki, is not only one species, it actually consists of multiple species, over 30, which with often narrow distribution ranges done by Ahmad Reza Kartusian, or in the Antarctic, we identified that often species with broad distribution ranges have much narrow distribution ranges and actually flocks of individual species. And we described them also using morphological methods. And also for very common species like Gammarus fossarum here in Europe, it's, it's very common. We, we realized, like other people, that there are many species and we worked on assessing the individual peculiarities of, of those ones. And we often address questions of practical relevance at community and population level. Just a snapshot of, of a recent research piece on population genetics. We all know big dams, big weirs, they have severe impacts on biodiversity, yes. But what about the tens of millions of small weirs and dams and tunnels that you see everywhere? So this is what you see here. What's the impact on biodiversity? Maybe fish can swim across it, jump across it, but what about gastropods? What about uh, mollusks? What about crustaceans and hololimnic organisms? Flying ones, of course, no problem. But what about the ones that have no flying or terrestrial larval stages? And we saw that the impacts are there, but it's often very specific to certain barriers and species. So it's not like a general question or recommendation we can derive from this. So often the organisms in general seem to be able to get across it, but sometimes not. So nice study if you're interested in it. Unfortunately, no clear yes and no, but this is how life sometimes is. There's not always a clear yes and no. We are also probably well known to sometimes, well, point the finger to, to the weak spots of DNA barcoding. Sometimes it just doesn't work. So what? Um, there's no method that's just perfect. So sometimes you have young species like here with Ancylus fluviatilis where DNA barcoding and uh, or cytochrome oxidase data has not sufficient variation to actually classify the distinct species, whereas nuclear genome-wide data can do so. We have species that sometimes hybridize, so the mitochondria are found in both species and show a different pattern than the nuclear genome. And sometimes you have species which have strong geographic signatures, which may indicate you have distinct species, but then you look at the 
uh, genome-wide red data, and you see most of them are actually intermixing and part of one species. So fantastic research by um, several of my team members, which I really in this talk also want to explicitly mention because it's really me doing this fantastic research. I'm mostly a person sitting behind my desk nowadays. So our group's focus has shifted to fresh waters and the point is uh, that we shifted to fresh waters is mostly a, a pragmatic one. Uh, we are now located at a place where there's no um, ocean or a sea nearby, but we have lots of degraded aquatic ecosystems. And to put it into greater context, we see that fresh waters are in particular threatened by the impacts of global climate change. They are the lowest points in the landscape and they accumulate all the, the toxicants and pollutants. Um, so what you see is for the monitored population, mostly vertebrate populations, there's a much greater decline in freshwater biodiversity compared to terrestrial and marine invertebrates uh, um, species. And on the other hand, if you just look at the area, so and the density, so how many species per, per square kilometer, you see that because they are just, uh, they just contribute to a tiny fraction of the surface, but they host really so many species, they are yeah, biodiversity hotspots. We know quite little about the invertebrates. The tinier things get, organisms get, the less we know. And therefore, there are a couple of papers out identifying positive trends, negative trends, positive trends when it comes to uh, abundance, but sometimes the diversity is less known. Other studies, this one, I really recommend you to read that. Um, realized that there's a trend of finding within the last nine years, so it's I think 2010 to 2019, more and more stressor tolerant taxa and generalist taxa, warm adapted taxa, less of the specialist ones. I just also would like to point you to this paper by Sonja Jenik and a couple of us where we highlight difficulties with some of the meta analyses it's not that simple to derive general trends. And if you have a positive abundance trend, it doesn't mean that everything is good, which those papers actually also don't state, but I think one has to communicate that clearly. We are in the need of an agenda. And Sonja Yenik, Alain Masri um, had this paper where many of us all around the globe contributed to um, me as well. And we highlight aspects where freshwater research really needs to um, focus on with respect to data infrastructure, novel monitoring methods, ecology, management, social ecology, in particular, the links between the disciplines are so important when you cannot optimize all the different goals. So humanity wants clean water. We want a lot of biodiversity um, restored, but sometimes these two targets are not fully compatible and how to find solutions to this dilemma. I would in particular, jump on topics here, study the responses of biodiversity to multiple stresses, which is one of the key points. And I would like to talk about develop new innovative methods for biodiversity monitoring where um, our group has a strong competence. I will touch base also on the other aspects briefly. So with our competence in freshwater molecular ecology, method development and biodiversity monitoring, we want to contribute to this agenda. We really want to address this science application gap and contribute to many of these um, international and European goals with respect to improving biodiversity and ecosystems. So now really to the topic. Why can barcodes, why can genetic methods help? Why do we think it's important? This is a nice example produced by former PhD student, Jan Macher, now in Naturalis in the Netherlands. He studied mayfly species of the genus Deliatidium together with Romana Zales and our colleagues from Bochum and uh, uh, Otago. And what you actually see is here in the Southland region with increasing nutrient concentrations and increasing deposited fine sediment, Typically, in particular with increasing nutrients, the richness of mayfly, stonefly, caddis, caddisfly genera decreases. Sediment has a weaker impact, but the question is, this higher level index effect, do we see that at individual species level? Because they are the building bricks of these indicators, right? And what we see at first, that they are cryptic or 
actually there are there are known to be several species you can identify them as adults but not as larvae and what we see is there were 12 of them we identified and um, we looked at the specific responses to the two stressors increased nutrients increased sediment for the three most abundant clades and what we see the first most abundant clade the black one here on the map you see that here distributed all across the area is rather insensitive um, in the range of the stressor concentration studied. When it comes to the second clade, we see a strong decline with increasing nutrients, but not a decrease with sediment increase. Vice versa, clade three, that's actually clade three is the brown one here. So you find them really all across the area, decreases with increasing fine sediment, but not with increasing nutrients. So this is really very interesting evidence highlighting the importance of going down to species level. The problem is if we study a typical, let's say an agricultural stream, but you can, you name it, you can take the river Rhine or whatever you want to take. There are various factors impacting on biodiversity in there. Flow often is reduced due to less discharge in summer months or a more um, fluctuating periods. So you have really strong um, precipitation periods and then lots or long droughts, salinity increase, which is related to this on the one hand, but on the other hand, also uh, due to increase of fertilizers, the conductivity uh, changes, and there are various other sources of salinity. Temperature increase, not only speaking of climate change and heat waves, it's also simply removing riparian buffer vegetation, buffering vegetation, enables the sun to just heat up the water and that works smoothly. So what you see is an unshaded versus shaded stream. They have strongly different temperatures, pesticides, microplastics, heavy metals, you name it. The point is we know if we have not only one stressor, but if we have two or three or more stressors, so many degrees of freedoms, and that's the DF, things can get complicated. So biological responses can get complicated. You know this, if you read the, I'm lacking the English term at the moment, you know, if you get a prescription and you have a, you have pills against whatever high blood pressure, then you have the, um, there's always what you should not do when you swallow the pills. So there are some other pharmaceutics you shall not take together with that because there are interactions between those. And the same can happen here. In the best way, the effects of the individual stresses just add up. So they are independent, just add up. But sometimes the effects of both stresses can weaken. Thus, the effects of stressor one plus stressor two is not one plus one equals two, but one. Or they can enhance the effect and, for example, have much more negative consequences. If you're interested in that, Sebastian Berg, um, who is first author of a big paper, Nature Ecology Evolution, on that content, um, also has a behind the paper section in Nature Ecology Evolution, where he really zooms into this issue. And it's really nicely written. I recommend you to read that. So our masterminds between the conceptual issues are those guys from, from New Zealand. Jay is now in Trinity College, Dublin. So Jay Piggott, Christoph Mate, Colin Townsend, they kind of made the framework for that. We are um, quite stupid when it comes to complicated ecological theory. So we are just um, hitchhiking on, on the concepts they develop. But you can nicely see if you have a control and then a stressor A, let's say stressor A removes five species or impacts on five species that are not found after the stressor um, impacts. And you have a stressor B, that removes 15 different species, so that cannot cope with stress B. Then an additive effect would be the 15 removed here plus the five, which are different here. So if it would be some of them overlapping, then it would be 11 or 12. The problem really for the practical side, the bad, the good, uh, the good, the bad, the ugly, the ugly is really the negative synergistic ones. If you have stress of A plus B having a much worse effect, remo removing many more species, than were removed or anticipated based on the individual responses. So this is really what, from a practical side of view, we have to find out, understand, and give recommendations. To do so, we focus on mesocosms. We use mesocosms um, in particular because field experiments, the degrees of freedom are huge. Every stream is slightly different. You have realistic conditions, but difficult to control the conditions and few replications. 
lab experiments, classical ecotoxicology, we also do, but field mesocosms, you can, can combine the best of the two worlds. And I will just show you one experiment from the recently granted Collaborative Research Center, CRC Resist, that's also the link to the website, where you can see we use the Xtreme system developed by the colleagues in New Zealand. And here we have 192 channels where we can respond to this. The water comes from the stream directly. We have natural light, natural temperature conditions. We can heat up the water up to six degrees and put it into the fully randomized placed aquarium. This really provides an amazing opportunity to combine classical lab experiments and the current field studies to be in the field and do lab experiments. This is how the aquaria look like. There are about 1000 invertebrates in there. You can place, that's what we did here, also fish in there and let the fish prey um, on the invertebrates. Here you see there are influxes of salinity. So you can increase salinity by 100, 200, 300, 800 microsiemens per centimeter, you name it. So, so far we ran, in our group, we ran um, four experiments and we published so far, um, no, in general from the extreme systems developed by Jay and then Christoph, there are more than 20 studies from this extreme system worldwide because the big thing is this extreme setup is found all around the globe. So Christoph and Jay are involved in projects in Brazil and Japan, China, wherever. These are experiments we conducted at the Breitenbach in Hessen, in the Felderbach in North Rhine-Westphalia. You see high replication, natural light temperature regime, regime, water directly from the stream. You can run factorial and gradient designs. Both we did so far. And now let's come to a few results and to show you why I think it's good to use barcoding as well. Here are the fantastic or some of the fantastic guys, mostly in charge of the extreme experiments, which consumes a lot of time. What you see is if you apply stresses, this is our control, no stresses applied. V minus means reduced flow velocity. N plus means sodium chloride added. So this would be two stresses, increased um, sodium chloride plus reduced flow velocity. And these four bars are then with a sediment added. So without sediment, with sediment. Eight replicates, these are the error bars. What you see is mayflies, don't fly, caddisflies, just don't like the stresses. Whereas chironomids, non bitimids have the opposing trend. They like it. If you look at the responses of those higher level um, taxonomic groups, you see the effect sizes and the trends, even an interaction term for salinity plus reduced flow velocity. The question is, are all the same? Are all chironomid species responding like this family level metric? Are all the EPT species responding similar to what we see here in the combined metric? This is difficult to see for EPT. Yes, we can often go down for some to species level, for some to genus level, um, but chironomid in particular, we can only stick to. We can only stick to family level because we are talking from one experiment of 60,000 specimens. So more for IDing 100K specimens, so altogether here, many of which are tiny, it just doesn't work smoothly. You have to make, uh, you have to find a compromise between precision in determination and speed. So what we then did, we published the studies, Anne is the lead author on these and Vasco Elbrecht on, on the first one. We did this based on morphological identification, but now we thought let's use meta barcoding and use the data and compare the results at individual species level. First of all, this was one response variable, chironomids. Now, after meta-barcoding from one experiment, we found 183 OTUs at a 3% clustering threshold, still 142 if there's a 5% clustering threshold, which some people recommend for chironomids. This is not implausible because we know from, for example, Breitenbach, one of the best studied streams in the world, that there are much more than 100 um, chironomids described based on morphotaxonomy from the, from the stream itself. So this is all fine. The question now is, does stressor response detection improve with the data? First of all, what we see for one of the most um, important mayfly families, the trends we see matches the one that we see based on morphological counts. So that's, that's uh, congruent, fortunately. 
But if we look now at different species within the group heptagenates, we see that, for example, um, Retrogena semicolorata shows the same trend as the heptagenate pattern, but Ectoneurus torrentis, this guy one, absolutely does not respond to, to the different variables. So how can this happen? Well, as written here, this species, and that's a nice movie I found um, on YouTube, it's not made from our group, Ectoneurus torrentis can ventilate the gills and therefore maximize oxygen uptake and it feeds on fine sediment so different to the to to the other groups which hated sediment deposition and reduced flow velocity this species just can deal fine with that coming to the chironomids uh, same picture um, we have 100 plus species just looking at the 35 most abundant otus what we see is they are not responding similarly there are 35 different and distinct ecological response patterns to the multiple stresses applied for, the, for those ones. And you see some are really sensitive or some really like the stresses. Some are probably habitat specific, very sensitive to, uh, or they very much like increased salinity. So very different depending on the OTU or species that you deal with. The problem is we really have to work on those groups. So projects like GBOL3 in Germany are so important to fill in reference library gaps for the poorly studied insect taxon. So this is our group's approach. We use most often experiments, field experiments, lab experiments, and combine them with high throughput meta barcoding. And we have a very nice collaboration with Christian Meissner from Süke and Toke Hoye from Aarhus University. And, um, other people where we now use high throughput image recognition, deep learning, so that we get more quantitative data on biomass as well and other traits for the specimens that we analyze. So prior to uh, do the, doing the genetic analysis, they are imaged. Yes, and I think this combination, multiple stressor experiments for a systematic testing of individual and combined effects then together with the increased taxonomic resolution from metabarcoding and more quantitative data from the image side will really help us to gain knowledge. So information and knowledge um, to support stressor research, ecology and monitoring. And in particular, RESIST, our collaborative research center is a key to that. And here, just to mention that the endpoints after stressor, stressor action, I guess are very important to keep in mind when studying trajectories of recovery, because often we see it's kind of dead ends. Time is no healer is a paper that was published by Moritz, uh, Moritz Labs and Peter Hase, also from at our university and Senckenberg, where you see you switch off stresses, but communities don't recover. So there's kind of a legacy that um, is inherited to the community, which limits their recovery potential. And this is what we also study here. And we use extreme as well to study these. Um, recovery tra trajectories. Now the second big point, develop new innovative methods for biodiversity monitoring. I think we are quite, quite good here and quite creative. Um, I want to highlight a few projects where we are working on novel monitoring methods. We develop, test and help implementing the methods. The first study was done by Vera Zitzka, who is now in Bonn at the Leibniz Institute for Biodiversity Change. Uh, that was done as part of GBOL2, German Barcode of Life Project 2, where we could show that the results for the ecological assessment for the formal directives are very similar between metabarcoding and traditional methods, which is good. But a clear plus here is that if you sample across years and seasons, the assessment results are very stable. Sometimes you have a shift here between a status class plus minus one, but that also allows us with the method to sample in winter, in autumn, whenever, but not only at the very narrow time window when you have to sample according to the directive because the organisms are in a um, state where you can identify them. We use also time machines. German, the German federal environment has a specimen or a, um, um, a sample, an environmental sample uh, um, storage space where there's lots of sample for samples, for example, from deposited fine sediment from the major rivers at many sites. We use this as an eDNA source 
and we can track then back in time when certain species appear for the first time, whether they appear all the times. So this is really good to retrospectively study when species appear, but because samples are being taken, this is a fantastic resource for monitoring. And this goes back sometimes 30 or more than 30 years. As part of large projects like LTD, we perform insect monitoring studies using eDNA or bulk metabarcoding. And what's amazing, you get so much more information compared to what we know from many, many years of traditional sampling here, 263 sampling points across many, many years. That's one year of eDNA sampling. You have so many taxa, we removed the, the ones that we could not assign to species. And we bridge the blue-green barrier. We not only focus on the freshwater biodiversity, this is a study as part of the GDNA project funded by a Federal Environment Agency. This is, we're not the first to show this. It's known that the molecules, DNA molecules of organisms living in the habitat surrounding a freshwater are also found in the water. So you find lots of birds, lots of mammals, as well as, of course, the fish species. And this can be used as well. And uh, Tilmacher, whom you just saw here together with Robin Schütz, they just had a cool idea because canopy monitoring in forests is really a difficult thing. I cannot um, speak from, from own experiences, but seeing the climbers going up there or seeing the canopy foggers, um, this is super invasive. Till and Robin thought, let's just place a collection um, plastic, um, um, a plastic a piece of plastic uh, beneath the, the tree just before a heavy waterfall or heavy rainfall comes and collect the water. They did so beneath four trees. And then they filtered the environmental DNA from the water. And what you actually see is lots of insects and sometimes spiders that you um, get from the environmental DNA. And many of the hits that you have, if you talk to the ecologist, Thomas Hören is uh, part of our author team here, you see these are species, and in the literature it's reported that they are mostly found or only found on that um, um, host tree spe um, species. So we have only four trees. We cannot explain the world with that, but I think this is really a way forward. It's a small method paper in review at the moment. I think there's potential. This is cheap, this is fast, and still quite... Uh, not comprehensive, but there's a lot. Then we focus on scaling up methods. Dominic Buchner is our mastermind in the, in the lab, scaling up, for example, the processing of thousands of malaise trap samples. We could do that in, in weeks. We, we process 2,000 malaise traps, sorted malaise traps in, in 12 weeks. So generating massive data sets by using, in particular, high-throughput liquid handling machines. So you can see the strategy here. Actually, Dirk, it's built on the paper you and Vasco wrote and published in Freshwater um, Biology 2019. It's a very similar strategy in terms of the deck layout of the plates. Yeah, and I think this is important for the agenda. If we want to have better sensors to see what's happening, to sense and safeguard freshwater biodiversity, we need these approaches. And for the agenda, also the data infrastructure side is important. We realize that with most of the software, we run into problems. If you want to analyze 4,000 malaise strip samples, including the replicates, um, and you have 1 million reads per sample, most of the software will just um, say farewell to you. So we had to write new software in order to do so. And that's the software called AppScale. You can already download it, graphical user interface, command line as you like it. It is super fast and scalable, and you can analyze millions of reads in that in a really, well, I would say very short time scale. This project is also supported by NFDI for biodiversity, the German National Data um, Research Data Infrastructure Project for Biodiversity. Our aim is really to close the the information and knowledge cycle. So we want to bring the metabarcoding data not only to data scientists, informaticians, or people like me, but to the people that really can work with those information in terms that, that have the ecological knowledge or that have to do the monitoring. Therefore, we also wrote a software. It's not the only software out there, but I think it's particularly good. Platform, independent, graphical user uh, interface, modular and reproducible workflow where you can really work also as a non-informatician with the, 
with the data, the huge data sets you have. So feel free to download it. Taxon Table Tools is the name. Yeah, to come to an end, I think we really are in need of an agenda in order to sense and safeguard freshwater ecosystems and protect biodiversity much more effectively as we do it right now. My key message is, and this is very, very honest, I think we have to continue to work together, even strive to more collaborations than we have right now, bridge the gaps between the different disciplines, the generations, cultures, and countries. Only with that, we can move forward. And the Aquanet, I think the network most of you may know that I led for the past um, five years was very successful in starting to, for example, initiate standard development, formal standard development for DNA and eDNA methods. And Bioscan is just wonderful on the one hand because the runtime is so long, but in particular because of the global scale. Bioscan really unites people all across the globe. It focuses on species not only in, in rich countries, but really everywhere. And a particular focus also on, on countries where there's little knowledge and little funding about biodiversity. So, we have to put species, their interactions and dynamics into the focus. I love that for this project and a part of Bioscan uh, project since a while, also of the European branch of it. But there are many more and I think we have to watch out and we all are doing that. I just want to stress is that we have to try to work together because it's not so much about us, but it's about our globe and the inhabitants and humans are just one species. It's about protecting biodiversity. With that, I would like to thank all the collaborators, the fantastic DNA Aquanet team, the Bioscan team, all the different teams that supported our work, that contributed with data, with knowledge. It's great, great fun to work with you, but um, it's very important that we continue with our work. It's amazingly important work. I'm up for it and hope you too, and I'm looking forward to working with you for the next couple of decades. Thanks. I cannot hear you, Dirk. I'm, I can try to read from your mouth what you're saying, but it's... Now you should be able to hear me. Yep. Okay, one setting, one setting I missed, thanks. Alrighty, um, welcome back. So for the audience out there, if you wanna ask questions, then I ask you to please use the chat function because I can sort of follow it at the same time while I talk to all my guests here. And I can field your questions to Florian, Anna, and Till. So thank you, Florian, for your presentation. And then the other thing is, I'd like to welcome both Till Maha and Anna Bermann to, to our group, to our panel. So um, this was, was great learning about your research. Florian plugged in everybody he could, so that's great. So. I already have one question. I was I was under the impression, okay, I have to jump in and have my own questions. I'll put them aside because I have a few, but um, I have already Dan Bach who said, great talk. Can you identify a level of phylogenetic divergence at which stress responses are conserved? In other words, how fast do generalists or specialist strategies evolve? Uh, that's a good question. Um, maybe I can try to, to answer this. We have since a while actually a project going on with Alex Laini, who does this, who basically use our short meta barcoding reads, maps it those back to a strong phylogenetic backbone tree in order to um, address the question of phylogenetic divergence or phylogenetic diversity and the responses of um, yeah, stress or environmental effects on, on this level. I cannot answer that um, reliably. And But what we see is that 
it often very much depends. So often we see that they are really, like with Delea tedium, closely related species showing very different responses, whereas sometimes, and this probably holds true for many of the mayfly, uh, caddisfly, um, and stonefly species, often the responses are quite conserved even across this, this large group, which um, has a common ancestor a couple of hundred million years ago. So um, I'm not competent to give a simple answer to that. So I really think it depends on stressor and, and the species. Somebody else wanted to jump in? Okay, because I've, I have another question this time from Merat, who says, thanks for the nice talk about the use of historical samples. How do you ensure the integrity of the data generated from these samples, given that they were not collected for sensitive genomics approaches? And could be degraded or contaminated in storage, et cetera. Yeah, I, I think I can answer this question. So um, we cannot really control for that. And the way they are preserved is depending, it depends on the, on the sample type. For example, Merat, the samples um, we showed were from collected fine sediments. And there are traps, sediment traps in the River Rhine at various stations, River Danube, River Elbe, and therefore one month the sediment is collected. So the water goes in, the sediment sinks down, and then you have 20 kilograms of sediment, and this is collected monthly. So within this month, a lot of degradation will happen. I think the point is, after that, they take it, they homogenize it, and it's frozen at minus 190 or what liquid nitrogen has. So there are 270 something huge liquid nitrogen tanks since decades where all the samples are stored. Yes, probably those samples will be degraded, but the thing is, this has always been the same. There's always a standard one monthly sampling. And this I think is good. Now we are checking actually how fast the degradation is by sampling it more frequently. There are more samples, for example, leaves, and they are collected fresh. And they are homogenized and then stored in liquid nitrogen. So there it's much easier. Still, of course, degradation processes take place. I think the strength is, that the, irrespective of when and how much degradation things um, or happen, there's a clear standard of how samples are being collected. So the degradation will always be the same. And as soon as they are in liquid nitrogen, nothing will happen. I have a little follow-up to, to these type of samples you have there in, in, in storage. How much metadata is associated with that? How much do you know? Did, was there any kind of environmental data? Was it standardized? so that you have a set of environmental parameters that just go with that set of historical samples? Um, yes, also depending on the sampling site, but usually those samples were selected by the Federal Environment Agency to trace um, pollutant or contamination, mercury pollution, et cetera. So there's, besides the typical meteorological data, you have also for several of the stations, um, chemical data, but often it was also put at some places based on design. So in more um, rural sites versus more um, urban sites, closer to a, to a power nuclear power plant or farther away. So there's metadata associated to that, but there's a lot of more metadata unconnected, which we are currently also with, as part of the Trend DNA project trying to link to this. So I don't see any questions at the moment. Everybody else feel free to jump in at any point. I have one regarding that rain sampling thing, and that's probably not one that Florian needs to answer. So just to try to get somebody else to talk. Um, when you collect those, is that purely an eDNA thing or are these insects essentially when there's heavy downpour, are they just washed down? Or how do I have to think about the, how that kind of sample? Yeah, so what we collected is uh, the rainwater. So we had a like a foil uh, where the uh, rain fell in. And to exactly check for this one, we also collected all the specimens, all the insects uh, that fell into the rain sampler. Because of, of course, we don't know then if the signal comes from the species or the specimens that are in the water or the ones that are live are living in the canopy. Uh, so we checked for that. Uh, it's also in the preprint. Mm -hmm. We actually found much more species um, that 
where the signal derived from a canopy uh, than species that were actually in the uh, in the rain water that we collected. So you're essentially washing the DNA of the leaves or wherever exactly. they have been sitting and left cells on what, what yeah, maybe exactly. behind. So that's, that's the point cool. of it, so that we have a passive uh, sampling or non-invasive sampling. Yeah. All you need is rain, which I heard you currently don't have. But <laughs> yeah, that's the uh, one downside of it. Of course, we are depending on the rain. Yeah. I, don't get me wrong, it, it's fantastic because I hear what Florian said in his talk. It is a bit of a difficult thing to do canopy sampling. It's usually connected with a lot of technical burdens or any way of climbing up there or having even technology that leads you there to collect things or you fog everything that's just living there. So the idea of that. Have you thought of starting to some sort of a comparative analysis seeing what your approach versus a standard applied approach would would re, um, retrieve is that in the thinking it is in the thinking so i mean as ryan also said we just had uh, four trees here so, and we didn't do a morphological uh, monitoring or canopy monitoring like in a traditional term so we don't know how comprehensive the method is in terms of what is actually there and what we find mm -hmm. but yeah it is and the thinking that we do a bigger study because this was just really testing the method. So do we find invertebrate DNA in the rainwater? But it was not an ecological study or it was just a small preliminary study. Okay. Um, Florian talked a lot about um, meta barcoding type studies. So we're talking kick net samples or samples through your extreme system, whatever. So an eDNA, it is a thing, obviously. I don't know if it's a question for Florian, for honor or so. Um, how much do you think you can replicate everything you found there using eDNA? Uh, Anna, do you want to jump on that one? Uh, how much we can replicate it? Yeah, let's, let's assume you do everything again and just use eDNA for that me measure. You mean like generally in streams? Um, I mean, it's, it's difficult because we know that streams can change from year to year quite a lot. Um, but of course, with the long term data, we can we can have a good idea if things are they are just one time or reoccur in the stream. Um, and of course, uh, yeah, we can we can compare to morphological data if we have it right. Yeah. But yeah, it's a it's a question or um, it's an aspect that has a lot of degrees of freedom. So um, it's quite difficult to to give a general answer to that. Oh, it's okay. I have one more question from Tamara Shenika. I hope I pronounced the last name correctly. For the extreme mesocosm experiment, was a predefined number of individuals from the different taxa set into each tank, and how were the abundances quantified at the end of the experiment? By meta barcoding reads or simply by counting individuals of species you could identify? Uh, Anna, this is probably also you I can. Guess I can take that. that yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it would be wonderful if you could um, have a predefined number of individuals per tank, but that's just not possible. So, in one experiment, we had over 100,000 uh, specimens. So, that would be very, very really tedious um, to do that by hand. Your sound is a little off. It's off? Yeah, now you're check. better. Okay. You probably have to be closer to the mic. Yeah, I probably have probably to be closer. So um, what you normally do is you just take a lot of um, kick samples and you try to distribute it equally, all the specimens you collect from these kick samples. But you, you don't know for sure if you have the equal number, um, but we have a high number of replicates. So that's what gives us confidence in what the data. But yeah, the other way would be better. And regarding the abundance question, um, so what we did originally is yeah, analyzing the complete experiment based on morphology and count data. So we identified every single specimen down to the lowest possible um, level, which is sometimes species often just family level, for example, for coronomids. And we basically later for the meta barcoding study, we use this information. So the different samples were pooled according to abundance data. So in theoretical design that you have an equal number of reads per specimen, that is, of course, not perfect because sometimes you can have a larger specimen having more DNA and sometimes a smaller one. 
So it, it doesn't really give you an idea later. You, you cannot translate the read numbers back into abundances, but it gives you a rough estimation um, if there's an effect or not. Okay, um, currently I don't see any questions. Florian, you, you already at the end of your talk alluded to large scale collaboration, the role Bioscan could play there. Can you elaborate a little bit more how you would see that and, and what would be the best way of doing from the perspective of your stressor research, maybe, or anything else, how, how these collaborations should look like, could look like? Yeah. Um, so what I see is that I tend to be quite afraid of all the creativity that comes. I, I very much love the creativity that we have, but this creativity sometimes leads to the point that everybody thinks that his or her approach is kind of the best one. And maybe that that's also true. The point is, we had this in the, for example, for the Water Framework Directive, um, bioindication process so to develop a biomonitoring program started in the 20th century, sometimes even a bit earlier. And everybody had kind of his or her own approach, which happens now that for comparing Water Framework Directive data in Europe, we have over 440 individual methods. And in order to compare these across countries, long, uh, more than a decade long process of intercalibration happened. And such a process can never be perfect because some methods you cannot really make intercomparable. But if you want to talk about trends, biodiversity trends, ecological status trends, they must be comparable, in particular if it's legally binding. So I think we have to find a structure where we find consensus at least about certain things, because otherwise we will not have 440 uh, in Europe, 440 intercalibrated methods, plus then a couple of thousand genetic methods on top, even more and more. This is a bit a delicate issue because you don't want to impose your way of doing things to others, but I think this is what standards have to play. So we have to identify from the community for, let's say, terrestrial monitoring, for barcode, reference barcodes, what is our experience when to trust or not trust a certain barcode and really polish, polish our infrastructure and our ways um, to, to um, move ahead with the high throughput sequencing data to make more use in the applied cases. Because yes, it's, it's not about our own individual research gaps. It's about making use of our data for yeah, global biodiversity assessment and monitoring framework. So I think this standardization aspect plays a role. And I think a main point is try to be as inclusive as possible, but still try to have the people that really know a lot about that work with the standardization committees in order to derive conclusions and make a formal standard out of it. Otherwise, we run at risk of losing a lot. All right. In that context, I got a question that sort of fits into that. Just it's probably more from a strategic point when you think of your DNA Aquanet experience. So um, if, if people were interested in casting a, very, casting a very similar net network out there, let's say over the Americas or somewhere else on the planet, would it be better to just think about something that spans more globally, extend the experience, extend what DNA Aquanet had, or just, just share all the knowledge, the protocols, the approaches, and let people establish their own frameworks or networks that are probably more um, following the local le legislation requirements and everything else. No, no, I think we have to think globally. And there are global networks with, that we can use, like Geobond, for example, um, um, the Global Earth Observatory um, Network. So they're the bond, the thematic networks within the biological observation networks, just as one example. And there's now a, even an omics uh, um, uh, working group, or I don't know what the exact term is. So I think it doesn't help us a lot if now, for example, people in Canada develop different standards as we do in Europe. Just by the way, I just received a fantastic email from Canada where they are developing eDNA standards asking us, would we like to consult or can we be consulted that we synchronize our activities? So I think this is essential that we are not having our um, ego shooter national roadmaps. We see it at the mo moment in the political situation that this can lead to, <laughs> well, will not happen with the biodiversity 
um, roadmaps, I hope, but um, it doesn't help if you have a national agenda and you just go with that. It can create problems. So identify the international frameworks. Eyeball is such a such an amazing international network, but now maybe link it more with the formal um, networks. ISO standardization, for example, would be also an obvious link. We are at the moment talking a lot about European standards. ISO is global. Yeah. Sure thing. Um, there is a question from Paul. Florian, this was a stunning presentation in terms of both scale and integration across approaches. Have you given thought to have we move from a model system to global biodiversity um, biosurveillance? So how do we do that? As a challenge here in Canada, we have a million lakes. How are we going to understand biotic change on this scale? Careful stratification of sampling design, maybe? Yeah, it, it all depends. Uh, thanks also for the compliments, Paul. Um, I very much believe that citizen science can play a major role here. This is also what I see in one Canadian project. It's called iTrackD, and I think uh, Guelph is also involved in that, where actually the involvement of the local citizens that, um, that creates a lot of power to sample at spots where individual teams or uh, governments can never go there. And we know one thing for sure, environmental DNA, while never it's a perfect method, it's rather simple. Shipping syringes out there is rather simple. So I think this scaling up to global biosurveillance can be facilitated by sampling, for example, water samples um, with simple citizen science supports. And it will also engage citizens to what we're doing, create more awareness. So this is one aspect that I would for sure very much focus on, irrespective of the formal um, biosurveillance frameworks we will extend. Okay, and I have another question. Utsav Neupane, hydropower dams use most of the water with only less than 20% left for rivers. Can, are there methods to measure the effect of hydropowers and biodiversity, to biodiversity and species richness? upstream and downstream specific eDNA collection, maybe? Now that's a good point. And we actually have one person that would like to come over and actually do exactly such, an, <laughs> such a study. I'm not sure if you have to work with water. The problem with water is what you detect downstream must, must necessarily be downstream. It can be the stuff from the lake, et cetera, et cetera. But we can use our classical assessment methods. And um, I totally share the concerns concerns you raise. We have to have a minimum flow. Otherwise, we really disrupt ecological integrity of our rivers if we keep all the water for human use and let the rivers downstream of the dams dry out. So minimum flowing uh, volumes is essential. And whether it's eDNA or classical sampling and then metabarcoding, yes, it for sure can be used for that. We have to talk about sampling design. Yeah. Okay. Oh, there. there came another question. Speaking about global networks, shouldn't there be more focus on method development in more species rich countries? It's great to have protocols working in the Arctic, but how <laughs> to make sure they will still work in Costa Rica? I think this is really the strength of Bioscan, isn't it? Right? The focus is very much on the species rich countries where there's not so much method development. And I see lots of papers being published on data from species rich countries uh, where actually the methods are being tested, whether they work or not. Um, so in many aspects, I think the tools developed will just work also in other environments. It's more a matter whether you have um, 200 specimens in your malaise trap um, in the Arctic and probably 50,000 in Costa Rica. And, but the method still will work. Um, you just have to put more effort on processing the sample. So I'm not, I think the, the key difference is reference libraries, right? I think we really have to more catalog the diversity in order to make, make sense of, of the data. This is really where I see the biggest challenge, not so much just the pure method difference. We know we can filter water from tropical rivers. We know we can take soil samples and process malaise traps, etc. Yes. Yeah, I agree. Reference libraries. 
and the rest is many of the stuff is as you said it's a matter of scaling scaling to the amount of diversity that, mm. that you're facing in the in the environment so um i don't see any new questions coming in and we are heading towards our one hour mark which perfect timing <laughs> as if we had planned that so number one thank you so much thanks so much anna till for joining in today thank you florian for an awesome talk very informative very interesting um, topics and um that is our last one before we take a little summer hiatus so our webinar will come back in september so watch out that space then for new announcements i cannot tell you who's going to be the next species speaker just yet but we'll get there so i wish everybody a nice summer um, whatever you do field work focusing on other things in your work and thanks again to our guests from germany enjoy the hot day over there we in canada will slowly get the temperatures too so we hear you and to everybody else have a great day and a great and a wonderful weekend bye everyone thanks a lot goodbye bye bye